Hey there, continuing in uh, 1 Corinthians. Um, I'm glad I got to do those balancing messages. Um, I want to look at Corinthians, not in the light of just our individual Christian life, but Paul's burden for the church. And it's, uh, you know, the church is Zion. The church is God's, he, he rejoices over the church. Christ gave himself for the church. He loved her. It's his bride. And he of all of us, is desirous of fellowship. You, you think, oh, I'm alone, and I don't have fellowship, and it grieves me, Lord, why don't I have fellowship? Where are all the believers that should be around me? Well, how do you think he felt? <laughs> he lived on this earth, and not a single person understood him, because he knew the Father. And the more you know the truth, the more you will see that you have nothing to do with religion and you have nothing to do with people who call on him falsely uh, and you will find yourself alone. You know, it's true. And you'll carry a unique burden uh, of con being concerned for things that nobody seems to care about and grieved over things that no one has a conscience about. Uh, you won't be able to participate in so many things and, and it becomes a lonely road. And that creates an even more thirst for fellowship. Where do you make your flock lie down? You know, uh, like the Shulamite said to Solomon, it's a type in Song of Songs. She said, why must I be turned aside as one who is veiled in the flocks of your companion? Tell me, my beloved, where do you make your flock lie down? And he said, well, if you don't know, follow the footsteps of the flock. And then when you find the shepherd's tents, bring your young ones there to tend to them, which is really interesting. Uh, first of all, what are the footsteps of the flock? The, it's the testimony of the saints in church history. It's the testimony of the, church, the saints in the Bible. Hebrews 11 is the footsteps of the flock. You know, we see the path that Abel took. We saw the path that Enoch took. And then uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Noah, Moses, um, and then the prophets. He lists all these people, not to make them into heroes, but to describe that they were regulated by a vision of something that no one else around them saw that set them apart from their generation. That's the point. And the vision is always Christ and the church, or Christ and his building, Christ and his altar. Christ, Christ. The altar is the prefigure for the tabernacle. The tabernacle is the prefigure for the temple. The temple is the prefigure for God's building, the city whose builder and maker is God. And that's why Moses went out, was for the testimony, for the ark, for the tabernacle, uh, for the feast, you know, and, and that's why Abraham went out because he had a vision of a city whose builder and maker is God. And that's why Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dwelled in tents rather than dwelling in cities. And Abel had an altar and Enoch walked with God, uh, knowing that judgment was coming. Noah built an ark, uh, which is also a type of Christ as the building work of God uh, to protect all the living things um, in groups, which is kind of like fellowship, right? Uh, and bring them into rest. Noah's name meant rest, and the ark came to rest uh, on the dry land after the sea had submerged all the wickedness. Well, that's a picture of baptism, according to Peter. We were baptized into the death of Christ, and now we're raised up together with him on dry land. And we're part of the building of God. We've become living stones, and we've come to him who was rejected of men, a choice stone precious, precious to us as well. And then Peter says, as we come to him, we are living stones being built up to be a holy priesthood to offer sacrifices, uh, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing. 
we we have the, we that's the footsteps of the flock. We've all been following the same path since Abel. Uh, towards Christ, towards Zion, towards the new city Jerusalem, and what drives that? You know, some people think it's a it's, it is that they want to get a reward or a wage or put God in their debt. That is trying to establish your own righteousness and not submitting to the righteousness which is apart from law, apart from debt, and all by grace in Christ Jesus. We submit ourselves to him by faith. Um, and in God's house, there are spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And they're, it's a living sacrifice. It's we ourselves give ourselves to him. But what drives that? Is it because we're trying to be rewarded? Is it try? Is it that we're not? We don't want to be punished anymore. We don't want to make him mad. We want to be good little boys and girls. Is that the limit of our vision? Absolutely not. What drives you is fellowship, a desire um, to be with those among those who have the same heart you do. But the problem is our heart's been transformed. Uh, through knowledge of Jesus Christ and seeing something of what he wants, Christ in the church, he loved the church and gave himself for her, and he put the spirit of his son into us, the spirit of sonship, and so now God's hunger and thirst for fellowship is our hunger and thirst for fellowship, and that's bigger than what we can handle <laughs> alone, and yet we often find ourselves alone. While it, we, if we didn't see anything, we would be fine. If we didn't see a vision, we would be fine in Babylon. You know, when uh, the psalm says that when we were in Babylon, um, we hung our harps on the willows and wept. And they asked us to sing a song of Zion. And we said, how can we sing of Zion in a strange land? You know, that's what it felt like in the institutional churches. We'd seen something of Christ. And we had a hunger and a thirst in us for the genuine fellowship, which is all part of God's plan to build the new city Jerusalem. And the, the fellowship is the building material and the content. And it comes out of the testimony, right? And all the people in the hall of faith, the uh, footsteps of the flock, all had this testimony, the testimony of God concerning his son, which involves the altar the, and the faith in the seed and the tabernacle and the temple and the view that we've been called out of this world unto a fellowship, a feast, uh, is what he said to Moses when uh, he said, you know, let my people go, that they can go three days journey to have a feast to me. You know, we have a vision inside of us that's all related to these things, the feasting, the fellowship, the joy. And that's not just heaven. Ultimately, that, that's our destination, but we do desire it here. And that's one of the reasons we felt we suffer and why we're lonely. And we find once we see something and we're clear about what we see, that we don't find our home in the flocks of the companions anymore. You know, so the, the beloved says, uh, or the seeker says, Show me, beloved, where you make your flock lie down. Why must I be turned aside as one who's veiled, as if I can't see anything, in the flocks of your companions? Show me, shepherd, where you make your flock lie down. There's a distinction, apparently, between this fellowship and people who know the Lord or seem to be affiliated with him, but have started their own flocks. <laughs> They're hirelings working for a wage, and they've got sheepfolds that are full of wolves and thieves and robbers. And the sheep are dissatisfied there and starving. And so you ask, where, Lord, where are you? Um, and he says, follow the footsteps of the flock. Well, what is the testimony? And so we discover, what we do is we go back and we discover, okay, what is the kernel of the Christian life? What's well, the testimony of Jesus Christ? What is the fellowship? It is the response to the testimony of Jesus Christ, especially in those who've received the Spirit of the Son, crying Abba Father and it's the fellowship with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ given to us as a gift their love relationship which is the eternal life is given to us as a gift as the Spirit it's called the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
but it's all based on God's testimony concerning his son. It all comes out of that message. Everybody in the cloud of witnesses, everybody in the flock who followed the footsteps, our left footsteps, followed his testimony. He's always done it by the word. Not by an inward experience that's only knowable to you and nobody else. No, it's through his message that's gone out to the whole world. And we who are his sheep heard his voice and followed. Uh, and we've all got that what we have in common is that we all know the same message and have uh, the same fellowship that's generated from the message. Because the eternal life comes by hearing. You know, we, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. And when the word comes, we're born of the incredible seed of the word of God unto the inheritance. And the inheritance is our destination, the city whose builder and maker is God. Everything we long for in this loneliness is going to be fulfilled abundantly for an eternity. But we've also been given the spirit as a foretaste or a pledge to guarantee uh, the inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. In other words, he doesn't want us to only know it then. He wants us to have a taste of it now. Certainly it won't be in the same measure, but God wants us to have fellowship. But what is the fellowship? It is based on the testimony of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ. And then when we receive that testimony, it is the spirit that testifies. That testimony lives in us as the spirit of the son who cries, Abba, Father, and as the spirit of sonship, same thing, but bears witness that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Everything that he has is ours. He said, all things that the Father has, uh, has are mine, and the spirit of truth will not testify of himself, but he will take from me and glorify me and give it to you, show it to you. So the spirit is in us to let us know the riches of Christ that he's entered into as his inheritance and share them with us. And that's part of the, that's, that becomes the fellowship. And the main thing that Jesus Christ has is the Father who says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And he has this privileged relationship with the Father as the unique. He was the only begotten son of God in the bosom of the Father. And yet he came and declared him. And now in resurrection, he's the firstborn of many brothers who have the same life, the same spirit, the same position before God. Not as objects of worship, he's obviously the object of worship, but we enjoy his acceptance. We are accepted in the beloved. Um, we, uh, we enjoy his position. We are seated in the heavenlies above all in him. We enjoy identification with him that we were terminated in his uh, death. Adam is done. The slave race is done. The orphans are done. The spirit of bondage and fear is done. The law is done. Sin is done. Death is done. The world is done. The principalities are stripped off. The commandments of ordinances uh, blotted out. Everything is taken care of at the cross, and we have passed through death his death into the holiest in resurrection onto dry land. That is the testimony of everybody who has walked in this path, uh, especially since the resurrection of Christ. Before, they saw it in types and figures. Now we have the reality. But if you want to know, where do you make your flock lie down? Where is this fellowship? His answer is follow the footsteps of the flock until you find the shepherd's tents. The footsteps are the, are the track of those who've walked according to the testimony and according to the vision. Um, and they left a footstep which is their own testimony. And so many of us have ended up reading a lot of writings of dead people when we didn't have anybody to fellowship with. And we had to cipher through a lot of them until we found the ones who had the testimony. How did we even know they had the testimony? Well, because we know our shepherd's voice and will not hear the voice of a stranger. 
There's one set of writings that brings me into bondage, makes me introspective, brings me under law, alienates me from God, brings me under condemnation, brings me into fear, death. I read a bunch of that stuff. And then there was another set of writings that I could confirm from the word and made sense from Paul's ministry, starting with Paul's ministry, really. He's the first one, I think, that we follow in Romans and Galatians. He left his footsteps uh, and confirmed the doctrine of Christ, which resonates with the spirit of sonship in us that testifies that we are sons of God and heirs and everything we have in him. Uh, and also bears witness that, of course, that Jesus is the Son of God and he who has the Son has the life. And we were affirmed in that, in the ministry. This is the New Testament ministry. So the footsteps of the flock are really the New Testament ministry. Where was this ministry in history, you know? So we read a lot of dead people books because we didn't have anybody to talk to. Um, how do you know when you found the shepherd tents? You know, okay, you're walking and following the footsteps. How do you know when you bump into a shepherd? Well, a shepherd, see, the tent, the footsteps are those that, things that are in the past left behind. But the shepherd's tents is where people are now. And shepherds must be uh, involved with the one flock because she didn't want to be in the flocks of the companions turned aside. She was looking for her shepherd and his flock and where he makes them lie down and he told her that the place it would be was where the shepherds are with their tents and she needed to follow the footsteps of the flock to find them so we are recovering uh we're doing it in reverse order you know at the early church corinth was established by the preaching of the apostles and they were baptized and they believed the gospel and knew not much. They were Gentiles. And then they learned in their experience through all kinds of failures corporately about the riches of Christ, which we'll see. He spoke the riches of Christ into their situation and that's where they learned. We've got a different experience. We're way after Corinth and the apostolic churches in the institutions running around like orphans finally going, this is not, this doesn't match anything that my spirit registers with and thirsts for. My shepherd's voice is not here. And we ask him, right? And so then there seems to be a wilderness alone time of coming back to the word. And like with my ministry, most of the people who, who have stayed with my ministry are not the brand new babes in Christ, really. They are people who have been through the ringer and got back into the Pauline epistles. Romans and Galatians especially seem to be, you know. And when I speak, they recognize it because they're familiar with these footsteps to some degree. They know that language. Where did they get that? That was their shepherd leading them individually and preparing them beforehand. And then there's some shepherds who are speaking the same language and they recognize it. Those are the affirming testimonies I get on my wall from comments of people who say, yeah, this is what I sensed. This is what I see in the word. It just wasn't loud enough and spoken enough by enough people for me to really lay hold of it and say, yeah, this is the way. But now that you say it, it's so clear. The word is just so open. When, where there's real shepherding, the word is open and easy to read. You know, one of the reasons why the word is hard to understand for many is because it is adulterated and mishandled deliberately and deceitfully uh, by the ministers to manipulate the flocks to get them to stay in their sheepfold. Um, and what happens is when people read the Bible, they go home and they read the Bible themselves, they don't come to the same conclusions that they heard from the pulpit. And so instead of saying, huh, maybe he's wrong, they say, nope, I'm probably wrong. And they even feel bad for disagreeing with the pastor. 
because they're gaslighted and stigmatized in the environment that this is the work of God. Who are you to speak against the word of God? To see the truth in an environment like that is an uphill battle because as you see it, you'll come under condemnation. Um, that's my experience and the experience of many others. They're like, okay, what he says is works, but what I see in the gospel is grace. How can I reconcile these? Well, you're not supposed to reconcile them. But most people think they're supposed to reconcile it because they assume that the flock they're in, the flock of the companions, has their interests in mind it is the shepherd's flock. Eventually, though, the seeker realizes, no, there's the shepherd's flock, and he makes that flock to lie down. But in the flocks of the companions, I'm turned aside from him as one who's veiled. On the one hand, it's like I'm, they think I'm veiled, they think I'm stupid, they think I can't see anything. On the other hand, as I'm turned aside from him, I am veiled. And I don't see him anymore. And I am clueless. And I'm tossed around and turned around and introspecting, and I don't see Jesus anymore. And all the joy is gone from my Christian life, and I think it's my fault because I'm a bad Christian. And when I express that, they tell me to get plugged in and get to work. Again, that's what happens in the Song of Songs. Every time she seeks for her beloved, she is beaten by the watchmen uh, in the city. You know, uh, They don't understand her seeking. Why are you dissatisfied? This is God's, this is it, man. You know, uh, you're just a murmur and a complainer. Well, eventually she had to go out. She goes out into the wilderness, actually. But when she comes back from the wilderness, she's transformed. And she's glorious. And he says, who's this that comes from the wilderness? She's like a pillar of cloud. I mean, it sounds like when you first read it, you think, is this a description of the of Christ and the tabernacle in the wilderness with the pillar of fire? No, this is the beloved who now matches him because she's been transformed, because she's been seeking him, getting glimpses of him, growing in the knowledge of him, and finally she goes out from the city and from the din and from the noise and from the false sheepfold. Uh, I guess this is a plug for Song of Songs. You might want to just read that. Don't think you're going to understand all of it. It's, it's highly, it's as coded as Revelation. Everything in there is in code in a way. It's, it's significant. But it's all about this relationship we have with the Lord and our thirst for fellowship and companionship. Um, but how do you know you hit the shepherd's tents? Well, you found the, you followed the footsteps. You have to have the testimony. See, what, what happened in the early church was that the apostles went out with the testimony and the people received the testimony and then were born again and became the church at the same time. And then the trouble came to the churches and they uh, received further teaching from the apostles to deal with the trouble. We have it different. We actually have already been through a big journey, many of us to come out of the, sh the flocks of the companions and we've been on our own searching the scriptures and also probably writings of dead people. I think of like Darby and William Newell and just, you know, whatever helped you confirm Paul's ministry is authoritative and his gospel is the way I interpret the Bible. Once you get firm on that, you're walking in the footsteps of the flock. That's what everybody has seen in church history that has had a, quote, revival in their Christian life that lasted where they actually became fruit-bearing Christians, real fruit-bearing Christians. Uh, and that doesn't mean that they were explosively visible on the scene, like a Reinhard Bonnke or somebody doing crusades. No, usually they're quieter than that. <laughs> uh, but... Fruit bearing means you have the joy of your salvation and you know why you can be confident before the Lord. And when you speak of him to others, they also enter that confidence and rest. That's fruit. You actually shepherd people into the pasture. Well, so the footsteps of the flock lead to shepherds. And eventually the past meets the present 
in people who are constituted with the truth that you've come to be able to recognize through your own journey of discerning truth from error. So Philadelphia being very weak, the end times church, uh, he says, you have a little strength, but you've not denied my name. You've kept my word. They've been following the footsteps of the uh, flock, probably very lonely, not uh, much sense of strength individually, maybe through a lot of failure and defeat. They've learned grace and they're not going to be brought into bondage again. They're not going to let anyone steal their crown. Well, now when they meet each other, the testimony that Paul worked to establish almost after the fact and confirm in the churches like Corinth, they were severely lacking. They were at the beginning of the church when even his writings weren't considered scripture yet. And he unfolds revelation in Corinthians that's really rich, but it's all in the context of dealing with their situations. Well, we have this opportunity where we have been set apart from all situations and have been constituted with the truth and have been wandering around and then now we're coming in to meet shepherds who actually represent the shepherd. And they it's not that they're bringing us something new, it's that they know what we've already, they testify what we've already seen in the footsteps of the flock. The testimony of God concerning his son and the vision Christ in the church, the mystery of Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory, and there's this fellowship of grace that is not a matter of setting ordinances up for people to follow, but uh, people being sensitive to the life in them for the sake of each other and learning how to put on the new man, learning how to be renewed, learning how to believe the gospel for themselves and for the members. So that I know that the same high priest I have is your high priest. I know that the same shepherd I have is your shepherd. I know that the operation of the measure in each one part is really in each one part. And if you have the testimony, I know that uh, that measure is operating. And I know how to look for the testimony. I know how to recognize a shepherd. I learned when I was following the footsteps of the flock. I know the difference between a shepherd and a hireling, a shepherd and a wolf. And you know what? You become a shepherd. Because the next thing he says is, if you don't know, follow the footsteps of the flock. And then he says, tend to your young ones besides the shepherd's tents. Well, how does she know the shepherds? Well, because she's followed the footsteps of the flock. She's learned to identify the truth. Through the testimony of God concerning his son on her own lonely journey, seeking him. And she's learned to discern the difference between the testimony and the abusive wolf system of Jerusalem, where every time she went out looking for her beloved, they, they would beat her. You know, she knows the difference between uh, rest and agitation. And now she finds the shepherds and she recognizes them because they match the footsteps of the flock. But what's interesting is it's expected that she's got people with her that she's taking care of. She makes her young ones lie down next to the shepherd's tents. This whole process brings you into fruit bearing. And it's not you bearing the fruit, it's you abiding in Christ. If that which you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you also will abide in the Father and in the Son. You know, John said... They need to go back to the, the beginning. The message they heard in the beginning is the testimony of God concerning his son that is confirmed by the spirit of the son and the spirit of sonship. And it's really the footsteps of the flock. And as we root and ground ourselves in it and abide in it, he says, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you will bear fruit. What is fruit? Fruit is not just being a nice person or doing exploits. Fruit means that you have entered into the rest you have the same heart as the Lord as far as you are hungry and thirsty for what he's hungry and thirsty for and you've discerned it from the systems of error and not only that but you're a shepherd you can't help it. you can't help it of course you're a shepherd what happens if a believer comes your way and you have the answers to peace in the conscience Christ is our 
righteousness. Christ is our sanctification. Christ is our rest. Christ is our life. I've been crucified with Christ. I died to the law. The demand is not on me. It's on him, and he is life in me. He's the spirit of the Son in me, and he's brought me into his position before the Father. My sin doesn't separate me from God. I run to God when I sin. I used to let it separate me because I would run away from him when I sin and think I needed to repent or do some other dead work. No, when I sin, I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who's the propitiation for my sins. And I've learned to come forward to him. That's the shortcut for the Christian life is to run to Jesus. And I've gotten really good at it. You know, I don't dwell in my sins and let them lord it over me. And because of that, the temptation doesn't have that much power either. You know, it used to be that I was tempted and condemned. And the con condemnation was 90% of the strength of sin. 10% of it was the temptation. But once the condemnation got lifted off, there was only 10% left to be dealt with. Yeah, sometimes sin tempts me. But it's easy really to not let it characterize my whole life because i'm caught up in a flow of fellowship with the father and the son by abiding in him and it makes me fruitful meaning that when i encounter someone who needs the comforts that i've been comforted with by god they pour out and i see that all over the place on the walls on some of these channels uh and in fellowships where i know People don't have to be taught to care for each other and taught to love one another and taught to bear each other's burdens and encourage one another and think of each other. And when somebody's missing, they go, hey, have you heard from so-and-so? I'm going to reach out to them. And it's not like I've done that institutionally and it doesn't work. It feels dry. You don't want to do it. You feel like you have to. This is different. This is not driven by wage this is not driven by reward and bait, carrot and stick. This is driven by a thirst for fellowship, you know, and we're members one of another. And this is how God's felt for 6,000 years, waiting for him to have companions that match him. But we're a group of people that are really special because we didn't start at the beginning of the church finding ourselves in a situation where then we had all these problems and the testimony of Christ hadn't quite been fully uh, established among us to hopefully rescue us, you know, from all the error. No, we followed the footsteps of the flock to the shepherd's tent and were mature, matured before we came to the fellowship. That is something different. That's something different. Um, it, it's creating a very unique situation. Uh, and really, this message is an in-house message. This one, this one, really, this message doesn't even apply uh, to 99% of the people out there. You know, they're going to listen to this and probably unsub or something. <laughs> what is he talking about? Uh, because if you don't know what I'm talking about and you haven't been through what I'm talking about, this is just like, huh? You know. Uh if you are hungry and thirsty and you know you've been abused in those systems and you're looking for rest the answer this is i guess a follow-up to the message i was going to do i did yesterday the answer is not to go immediately seek other christians what so many people are doing is they hop from group to group but they are never touched and dealt with themselves and a lot of people came alongside us because they didn't like the people that were coming against our teaching and they liked the fact that we were uh, contending with them. But really they were just looking for a fight. And eventually they, they were among us and as long as we were, as a, you know, as long as they were offended at those people and that was acceptable, that was fine. But they never, for some reason, never attached themselves to the testimony. They, test, they, they tried to attach themselves to a group of people and imitate their lingo. Well, eventually they got to go out, and they do. And they just go find another group to fight against the last group they were in. And it's just perpetual fighting and bitterness. No rest, no fellowship, no joy, no Christ, no dealing with the self. 
seared conscience. You keep doing this. Uh, all you are is an Ishmaelite, ass of a man with your hand against every man. You, you have nothing to offer anybody but a beating. That's not what we're here for. We're here for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And yeah, it puts us at odds with everybody. Um, but there were all these people that, you know, went out that are offended and angry and we're a cult and all this stuff. Uh, well, they were, were they of us in the beginning? No. <laughs> Looking back, they were secret, self-deceived people crept in on our way that believed something different than we did but grabbed our language thinking they could use it to fight. Uh, they wanted to, they just wanted to fight. And then they found themselves fighting with us, you know? Uh, and, a, and what it, what it really came down to is they never knew the testimony of Jesus Christ. They sure were good at parroting language, but really what it comes down to it, they're blind. You can see it. Um, They didn't care for the flock. They didn't have anybody that they were shepherding. That's another thing. It's like, he says, follow the footsteps of the flock until you find the tents of the shepherds and then take care of your, your young ones there. There's something about the real uh, thing. As you grow in it and really lay hold of it, you're going to have a care for other people. You know, and you're going to care about this one. You're, you, we're going to hear you saying, have you heard about this person? Where's this person? How are they doing? Oh, man, that grieves me that they are here now. They seem to have wandered off. Uh, but the ones who come alongside and don't have that heart show that they have not followed the footsteps of the flock to the shepherd's tents. They just saw a bunch of people out there wonder what they were doing and came up and joined along. You know, it's not the same thing. We have to come in through the door. Um, so, you know, I say all this because we are not Corinth. I mean, we're going to look at Corinth to see how he dealt with all the situations, but we are a different situation. We're not coming to a situation as already babes who know nothing except the gospel uh, and we don't know the first thing about living the Christian life we are people who have been aligned to match a situation that's been prepared for us uh, I think that's why the, the Lord saves the best wine for last uh, there's something different about what the refreshing that we're going to enter into or are entering into and why the enemy fights it so much. Uh, if you are someone who is attracted to drama and looking for a fight and believes everything you hear about everybody and doesn't believe that there's anything good in anybody that, that professes Christ, you're, you become so cynical that you can only see people through the lens of accusation. There is no way that you're going to be able to enjoy Christ and the fellowship, whether you're hungry or thirsty for it or not. Uh, and now we're living in a time when people with a seared conscience pretending to serve Christ, but really serving their own appetites, are willing to just lie and slander and say any manner of evil things about someone. And if you are attracted to that, you're going to be drawn to it. You're going to believe it. And that'll be where you go. People who believe lies, you know, the New City Jerusalem, the people who make lies and believe lies are grouped with the dogs outside the city. Uh, whoever maketh or believeth a lie. Um, to make a lie is to deliberately craft an untruth um, about Jesus Christ, his testimony, and those who follow him uh, in truth, who follow that testimony and have that testimony. It is to deliberately manufacture falsehood 
and to pursue people uh, in falsehood and gather people who believe the lie. See, for every lie, there's somebody that believes it. Well, the people who believe it are just as guilty as those who make it. Why? Because it's a contradiction of the testimony of God concerning his son, and that's what we're justified by believing. When you know that someone has the clear testimony of Jesus Christ ringing out of them from the rightly divided word, and you know uh, in, in your heart what they're standing for, and you deliberately turn from it from offense, uh, there is nothing, there's no light for you. You're not moving towards the light, you're moving towards darkness. And maybe you weren't even saved to begin with. I, I, it's always amazed me. It's a mystery how secret brethren crept in unaware can operate. How can you deal with the word of God and not tremble? And know that everything in your everything is exposed uh, to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The living word, sharper than any two-edged sword. He divides between soul and spirit and pierces to the thoughts and intention of the heart. And everything is laid naked open before his eyes. I don't see how you could make that think that you are an Israelite under the new covenant, uh, under the law, and that people who have the genuine testimony of God concerning his son are the deceivers who aren't saved. And yet you can go from wall to wall gathering people and lying. I, I've, I've never seen so much lying. Uh, these channels, you know, they will say... Like the one guy uh, came on my wall and he'd been pretending to be a sheep for like years on my wall. And I had seen some evidence before that he abused people. And there was one conversation he had on my wall with somebody saying, you're just looking for a license to send it. This is like a year ago. He reformed his behavior. He didn't act like that anymore. And I thought he was growing in the truth because he was manicuring his language to sound like one of us while he was among us. But I would hear from others and say, hey, no, that guy's over here arguing for worse. I just never witnessed it. Then one day he comes to my wall and berates after doing many posts, calling into radio, radio programs, getting increasingly offended at my teaching while pretending like there's no problem. Uh, he finally gets, he just can't have it. He just can't handle it anymore. He comes to my wall and does this big long post about how all the apathetic Christians should fear retribution and shame and loss at the judgment seat. And that's what should motivate them to do works. And it was awful. It was a, it was a blasting of the whole community, calling us lazy, you know. And it was not at all. It was, this is an evangelist. This is his view of the Christian life finally coming out he pretended like that wasn't his view for a long time while he was among us although I heard from others no that's not the case now he reveals it openly then uh, when we respond he goes out and says uh, on his you know wall that um, no this isn't to put fear in anybody. The Bible admonishes us to good works. And those people are teaching uh, that we shouldn't do good works. Um, and calling everybody who teaches that we should a wolf and a hireling. What was he doing? He was completely backing down his language again to pretend to be grace and make it sound like all he's talking about is encouraging one another to love and good deeds, which the Bible tells us to do and which we do do. Uh, you know, we teach on practical holiness. We teach on shepherding the saints. We teach on the Christian life and Christ in the church. It's all good works. Uh, but we don't teach that law and carrots and sticks is the motivator. No, it's the thirst for fellowship and a vision. It's being renewed with the knowledge of his will. He says, I call you my friends. You're no longer slaves. Slave doesn't know what his master's doing, but you're my friends. I tell you what I'm doing. 
And I'm going to give you the spirit of truth who will bring you into all truth and show you the things to come. That's why Paul prayed for us to have a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the full knowledge of him. And he said that the grace uh, is lavished upon us in all wisdom and prudence, making known to us the mystery of his will. Why? Because he wants us to walk with him as companions. He's hungry for fellowship, not slavery. Uh, this person who did that, though, is broadcasting that we teach uh, that you're not supposed to do good works. And acting like all he's doing is encouraging and admonishing good works. When I just publicly called him out and did a video and read his post where he castigated us all and threatened us with judgment at the Bema Seat, which is totally anti-Christ doctrine, uh, totally Galatian air, undoes justification. I mean, it is, it is an accursed gospel. Now, what is he doing? He is making lies. He's making lies. He's making lies about us, and he's making lies about the doctrine of Christ. And then he's making lies about what he said publicly. And there's people who believe it. Why do they believe it? Why can't they see this? Well, eventually they're going to be held accountable to see the difference between what he's saying and what God has said in his word. You know, and if you are someone who trembles at the law, it should break you. If it has not broken you but justified what you're doing, you are taking the wrong path. Because the law was not given to tell you how good you are. It is a condemnation of sin that everybody has in their members. And if you deny that, then Christ, you know, you deny the reason Christ died. You're denying the gospel. You're saying you have no sin. If you say that we can be under law, then that must mean you say that we do not have sin. Or you say that sin is not that big of a deal, and my little bit of sin doesn't mean I'm condemned before God and crucified with Christ. Uh, I can still be under the carrot uh, stick system of the flesh and still serve God in the flesh like an Ishmaelite and be pleasing to him ignoring the entire testimony of scripture and the gospel uh, and be self-righteous and manufacture lies about people and slander them and run around in little little packs of wolves it just amazes me that people can do this and call themselves Christians uh, you know this other person um just, I don't know, a week ago, shared someone's post that said that I am not saved because I do not believe we are under Israel's new covenant. And I've got 25 to 50 hours of teaching on that if you're interested in my new covenant playlist. Uh, I don't say anything without backing it up uh, from the scripture. They've never answered any of the points that we've made. They've not listened to what we've said. And they've mischaracterized it all. But, uh, you know, she says, David Benjamin's not saved because he doesn't believe we're under the new covenant. Therefore, he's denying the blood of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's just, what? Uh, how could you listen to five minutes of my teaching and think that? You know, well, this is someone who, out of hatred, is manufacturing lies. And then another channel saves, shares the post uh, to further the lie. And then just a week later, does a post saying that anybody who's saying that we're using the new covenant to backload works into the gospel and accuse you of not being saved is liars. But you just shared that a week ago that I, by name, was not saved because of my stance on the new covenant. How are you not making that into a work? How are you not backloading works into the gospel and saying that I'm not saved? And then a week later saying that anybody says you did that, you lied. But furthermore, we know that the teaching of the new heart under the new covenant has been used by Catholics and Calvinists and people in this community to fruit inspect and backload works into the gospel. That's why they do it. 
They say it, you didn't believe the gospel with your heart. You only believe it with your mind. Therefore, you're not saved. You don't produce what I consider to be the fruit. Therefore, you're not saved. It's always accompanied with an accusation that somebody's not saved and an excuse to not recognize someone by the testimony of Jesus Christ. Every time. I have yet to meet anyone who believes that we're under the new covenant, by the way, who even if they have a view of justification that's by grace, uh, by faith, you know, grace alone, faith in Christ apart from works, they believe that's get what gets you to heaven. I have yet to meet any of them that does not have a Galatianized view of the Christian life who teaches that sanctification and wor- rewards are attached to a carrot stick wage slave debt system and it's a matter of working in your flesh not faith in christ every single one of them even the ones that are grace evangelists are galatianized they have an accursed gospel they may preach the right gospel when it comes to what they call justification but it's a redefined justification that only sends you to heaven and doesn't give you anything now doesn't give you God himself and the spirit as the means to live the Christian life. And then it's a matter of living in the flesh by your effort to earn things from God that justification already secured for believers. Eventually you have to make a decision whether you're going to follow the footsteps of the flock and the testimony of God concerning his son, or if you're going to believe lies. And there's people manufacturing lies and believing lies. Uh, they're not in the fellowship. They have no fellowship. Some of them will forever not be in the fellowship because they're not saved. I'm sorry, how can you pretend to believe one thing uh, while secretly believing something else? You know, and then publicly make lies like this. That I just don't understand it. Uh, other than you are as evil as your works testify. You know, Jane says, I'll show you my faith by my works. Well, well look at their works. Uh, and some people don't like that we respond strongly to these people. and But we have to because, number one, it's a public marketplace. Number two, they're liars. And we need to distinguish truth and error and stigmatize lies. There should be a shame associated with believing lies. Twisting of the scriptures to justify yourself and condemn others. And they project everything onto us as if we're the ones saying, going around saying people aren't saved who have the testimony. No, we say people who are not, are not saved or they do not show the evidence of being saved because they do not have the testimony. We go by the testimony, not the works the condition of their heart, uh, what kind of sin they're caught up in, what they're sick. Because we know that the saints have been uh, mishandled and abused in the spiritual systems. And we don't judge according to that, except to the degree that it affects fellowship. Sometimes we have to separate because someone's sin problem is becoming an issue for everybody. But that is not judging their salvation. When we start going, is that person saved, is when we find out that they were pretending to believe something they didn't, and they actually believe something else. That's what all these people have done. Their doctrine is totally inconsistent. What they preach today is not at all what they preached months ago. And it's always changing. It's a moving target all the time. And they're not just learning. They may be ever coming to the... uh, ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth because they never end up agreeing with God's testimony concerning his son. If they did, they'd love us. But they hate us. They've gone out from us and they've shown that they were never of us. And all these people were originally in the fellowship, so-called. You know, at least on the wall, sharing our videos, uh, treating me with respect, asking questions on my walls, pretending to believe something they didn't, or running along with a channel, pretending to believe something they didn't. But there was always a tell in their language or something. You go, I'm not sure that person's as clear on the truth as we think. But you wait because you don't know they could grow. But we're not totally surprised and offended when they don't and they get offended and go off because all they're doing is manifesting what they originally were. Uh, 
while someone comes among us, we recognize them by the testimony if they have a testimony of Christ. But if they don't agree with God's testimony concerning his son, and maybe they weren't given an opportunity to really articulate what they really believe, eventually it would be manifested. And that's the basis on whether or not we fellowship. That's how we know the footsteps of the flock. That's how we know the shepherd's uh, voice. That's how we know when we hit the shepherd's tent. And that's what makes us shepherds. It's all the testimony. The fellowship and the testimony go together. Now, what these people, what these people don't like, or pretend to not like, is that when we find out that you don't believe the testimony, we stop fellowshipping with you. Or when you betray the testimony, or pretend to believe it with us, but then talk a totally different language as someone else, we know you're being duplicitous. You're not being honest. And we're not going to be around you. And then they get mad because they feel like they were betrayed by their friends because they run in packs, they're dogs. They don't see a loyalty to Christ and his testimony worth uh, paying a price for, and even if it means you're totally alone. Absolutely not. So they just go find the next group of people to join. Next mob. They're looking for a mob to join. Um, and they believe lies and manufacture lies. How do you know someone's manufacturing a lie? Well, they do not speak according to the truth of God's testimony. You know, I used to go to churches where it's like, I would talk to a pastor and say, well, you know, sanctification is this X, Y, Z, and this is really what... And they say, oh, yeah, I know, I know, yeah, uh-huh. I just, I'm, I'm going to get around to teaching that. I just, we, there's a lot to do, you know. They never do. And what God showed me is, look, according to the law and testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Eventually, the testimony should come out of you. If you have God speaking in you, you will have an expression, eventually, of that speaking that at least other believers can recognize. And if you never do then I have no way to determine if you're a believer. And if you eventually speak against the testimony, then I know I have to recognize you either as accursed, deceived, or not saved at all. But I don't have to fellowship with you. You've transgressed and gone beyond the doctrine of Christ. That's what we're commanded to do. These people want to call it divisive and not loving. And then say, oh, I came out of a cult. And I can't believe the way I treated people. You know, and then let, do an apology video with which lists names of all people who've railed against the doctrine of Christ or promoted the doctrine of Balaam or sensationalized and merchandised the sheep or called Paul an a false apostle. I mean, just look at their affiliations. It doesn't take that much to see that they are running against the truth. But we have stayed uh, put because we followed the footsteps and now we're resting here. We're not moving. Our teaching has not changed. A couple little things have been cleared up and become more pr pronounced. You know, like our view of discipline has grown. Uh, this is certain things like that. But uh, we're here for Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our life. Christ is everything. He's the pasture. He is the shepherding. And it's his testimony that produces the fellowship. And that fellowship is not something that originated from us. It's from the Father and His Son, and He's the one who's thirsty. And then He puts it in us, and we have the same kind of thirst that drives us forward to seek something different. Um, but what's different about this group of people is that they follow the footsteps of the flock before they found the shepherds, in many cases. And so there's a richer, uh, ex there's something richer that's happening that uh, I'm just telling you it's going to be good. I've spoken about a refreshing since I started this channel. A lot of people were attracted to that in a sensationalistic way, thinking, oh, God's going to pour out oil from on high. No, it's a refreshing that comes through renewal in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, through the doctrine of Christ. A joy that's going to break forth because Christ, you know, Peter said, you, you have a more sure word of prophecy which you do well to heed as a light that shines in the darkness until the day breaks and the morning star rises in your heart. The more sure word of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel, everything that God has accomplished in Christ for us and given to us as a free gift. 
And as we stand in our position as heirs, and we don't let anyone steal our crown, and we make distinctions between truth and error, and we don't manufacture lies or believe lies, but we only care for the truth, and we will only walk with those who abide in the truth, there's something coming for us. Uh, there's a joy that's getting richer and richer um, among us, and we're getting stronger. And the utterance is getting better, and the truth is pouring out even clearer. You know, they, they, they can't match what the Lord is doing. Earthly wisdom, worldly wisdom cannot match. Lies and manufactured of narcissists cannot match the testimony of God concerning His Son, Jesus Christ. So we can rest assured that He has the last word. <laughs> He has the word, you know. Uh, okay, well, this is not at all where I wanted to go. I wanted to teach on First Corinthians, but I felt like I had to do this. I'm not sure if I'm even going to release this message. We'll see.